tracking. And it's kind of like the priests in the Old Testament temple. There were lamps in the temple. It was the priest's job to keep those lamps trimmed and fueled and burning. Why? Because those lamps represented more than just the light that they gave to the temple. Those lamps represented, the oil represented the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The presence of God himself. The, the light, the fire represented the presence of the Holy Spirit and the power of God. If you look throughout the word of God, oil and fire consistently refer to the anointing and the Holy Spirit and the power of God. And so those, those priests had to be passionate about making sure that not one lamp went out. Why? Because that's what God had told them to do. That was part of their calling. That was part of their anointing. That was part of their ministry. Don't let that lamp go out. And I think that the Holy Spirit speaks to us in much the same way. Because just as the priests tended to the lamps in the temple, later in the New Testament, the scripture tells us, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Do you see where I'm going with this? Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are a priest of this temple. You decide what happens in this temple. And are you going to keep the fire of the Holy Spirit alive and tended to and the oil of the Holy Spirit operational in your life or are you going to let it go out? You see, passion is an easy thing to lose if we're not careful. Paul reminded Timothy to stir up or fan the flame of the passion and the gift that was in him. This kind of thing, being passionate about God, has nothing to do with your personality or your age. You see, I believe that our church has some individuals in it, some senior adults, who are passionate about Jesus Christ. They've been serving the Lord for 50 years, and they're going stronger than ever because of the fire and the anointing of God that's in their lives. Everything in life, listen to me, Everything in life will conspire against you to steal your passion for Christ. Everything in life will try to steal your passion for Christ. You say, Pastor, why are you telling us this? Because I am the shepherd of this church. It's my responsibility to remind us and to teach us and to bring to remembrance the things that we need to do. And I want to share with you just a couple of things real quickly that could steal your passion. And I want you to listen closely as I share these. I think an unbalanced schedule can steal your passion. Now, stay with me here. That means either if you're overworked or you're underworked, you're going to lose your passion for life and lose your passion for God. Life is a series of seasons, and the Bible says there is a season for everything, and there's a rhythm to life. There's a purpose for everything under the sun. And you need both in your life. You need both input and you need output. You need both rest and work. All of us do. And too much of either will cause you to lose your passion cause you to lose your passion. I feel like I'm doing some housekeeping in my own life today. Either of those things will cause you to lose your passion. Some of us, the problem is we're always giving out and we're always helping and we're always sharing and we're always serving and we're always working and we're always being generous and we never take the time to just recharge and rest and understand the importance of a balanced life and how it, how it facilitates our passion and our calling. Numerous times we have the example of Jesus Christ where he would pull away from the crowds and he would go to a secluded place with his disciples or sometimes even pull away from his disciples and go to a secluded place by himself. 
And he would fast and he would pray. Why? Because there's a recharging, there's a reinvigorating, there's a kindling of that passion when you step away for a moment. Now, I'm not, don't think for a moment that I'm telling you to step away from church. <laughs> don't think for a moment that I'm telling you to step away from your ministry or your calling. But I am saying that in that serving and in that ministry, you have to have time for resting and, and not overwork because you will lose your passion and you will no longer care. You will have what they call compassion fatigue. You just stop caring. You don't care about God anymore. You don't care about other people anymore. You don't care about anything anymore because you're just burnt out. When you care and care and care, you eventually get compassion fatigue. And so you have to be careful to allow that passion. How does that happen in our lives? I, listen, I have, I've known so many Christians that served God very well, but they never had an intimate personal relationship with God. You say, Pastor, how can that be? Well, how can it be that Jesus would look at people and say, they, they say to him, Lord, Lord, and he say, well, I don't know you. Well, Lord, I've served in your church. I've given water. I've done this. I've done that. And he looks at them and says, I don't know you. You see, part of this rejuvenation and this restoration of passion in our lives is that time spent alone with the Lord, just getting to know Him and Him getting to know us. Now, He knows your name. He knows the hairs on your head. He knows the very thought that's going through your mind right now about what we're going to have for, to eat for lunch in just a few minutes. I could see it in some of your eyes. What he doesn't know is a personal relationship with some of us. And you see, I think that finding this balance means not constantly ministering, 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 but taking some time to allow the Holy Spirit to minister to me, to minister to me. How do I do that? By initiating daily devotional time in his word. Daily time where I'm, I'm ingesting the word of God and the Holy Spirit is speaking to me personally. And, and it's not for me to give out to anybody else. It's what he wants to give me. You see, this is the trap that many pastors fall into. We, we study, we prepare for sermons and Bible studies, but many times we, don't, we struggle to take the time to just have our own personal devotions where we're developing a relationship with God. And this happens on a, on, a, on a corporate level as well for, for the body of Christ. We can be so goal-oriented on, I've got to prepare for this Sunday school class, or I've got to prepare for this sermon, or I've got to prepare for this worship set, or I've got to do this or that or the other, that all of our energy and passion goes into that rather than getting to know Jesus. See, we become overworked, we get compassion fatigue, but then there's the exact opposite where you're always taking in, but you're never giving out. You go to Bible studies, you listen to teachers, you listen to tapes, you go to seminars, you go to Christian concerts, you read books, you come to church all the time, you're always learning, always taking in, always growing in the input, but you're not giving anything out. We find ourselves in this place of Passion dysfunction. Passion dysfunction. You got too much input and not enough output. Let me, let me give you a little shock though here. Bible study is a fantastic thing. But Bible study without ministry can be extremely dangerous. You say, Pastor, how can that be? Because the Bible says in James chapter 2, verse 17, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, it becomes sin. Do you realize that the more you know about God's plan for your life, the more responsible you are to God for that knowledge? And the more you know, if you don't do anything about it, you are simply increasing perhaps your own judgment. You're increasing your responsibility because God holds us accountable for what we know. 
And we have to put that into action in ministry in our lives. So the Bible tells us that we need both in our life. We need a balanced schedule so that we maintain our passion for what we do. Because if we get exhausted in either overworking or underworking, we find ourselves in this place of spiritual exhaustion where we no longer even want to or care to. But also, an unused talent can steal your passion. Did you know you have a talent? You have a God-given talent? Every single one of us. I remember when I was a youth pastor, we used to do these things. They were kind of like crowd breakers, but it was, okay, anybody have a weird talent, a strange talent, a talent that everybody else thinks is crazy, whatever it is. You know, you flip your eyelids upside down or you, you can take your head off and swivel it around or whatever. And we'd have them come up front and do this weird talent because everybody has some kind of talent. And you may say, well, Pastor, my talent is holding down this pew. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10 says this, Each of you has been blessed with one of God's many wonderful gifts to be used in the service of others, so use your gifts well. Notice, God gives us certain talents and abilities for a purpose. He gives us personalities and gifts not for us, but for others. And if we're not being passionate and using those gifts, we are missing opportunities of serving and ministering to others, and we will be held accountable for those gifts. Do you remember the story of the talents in the Bible that the master gave each servant a, a set amount of talents, and they were to use those while the master was gone? And, and so the two, two of the guys used them well, and another one went and hid their talent. It was an unused talent. He lost his passion because of, he was afraid to use his talent. Stop being afraid of using the talent that God has placed in your life because you're worried about what somebody else is going to say or somebody else is going to think about you. That doesn't matter. If God's placed it in your life, you're accountable to him. Thank you. Your talents and your gifts are not about you. They're about what God wants to do in you. If you don't use your talents, you're going to lose your passion. Let me share something else with you here because it's not just about talents. You want to know something else that can steal your passion? Say yes. yes. Thank you. An, an unconfessed sin can steal your passion. Now, I know talking about sin is not a popular thing these days. I don't care. Because the Word of God is very clear about sin. And the judgment of sin. This, this is a big one. Few things rob us of our joy. Few things rob us of our confidence and our passion more quickly than an unconfessed sin. Because an unconfessed sin brings with it guilt. And here's how it works with us, with guilt, the sin in your lives. See, we don't walk around thinking, I have a sin in my life, I'm a guilty person. We rationalize it. We say, well, I'm, I'm not as bad as she is. Or if he's going to get to heaven, I have no problem. Anybody ever said that? Anybody ever thought that? As human beings, we have this guilt trigger in us. And, and, and I've found that I have a conviction trigger in me when I know there's something in my life that shouldn't be. And the Holy Spirit trips that trigger in my life and shows me this unconfessed sin. Because see, sin will steal from you. Sin will rob you. Sin will destroy the calling of God in our lives if we allow it to. And I think that we as the body of Christ and I think pastors all over this world need to start preaching about the necessity of being forgiven from our sins. Yes, I'm even talking about it in the body of Christ because we're not perfect. There are times that thoughts run through our minds or words come out of our mouth or actions happen in our lives that, that are sinful before God. It might be an act of disobedience. It might simply be an act of omission where we just don't do what we know we're supposed to do. 
And this sin gets in us, and you know what it does? It separates us from God, and it separates us from our passion for God. I'm talking about reigniting a passion here, church. Because I think when the flame goes out, we lose a lot. When the candle goes out in the temple, we lose a lot. We lose the presence of God. We lose the anointing of God. Think about the passion that drove Jesus Christ to the cross. Think about his passion for the will of God and the plan of God in his life. He would not be distracted by anything else. People would turn against him. He would not let that stop him. People would betray him, talk about him behind his back, sell him out behind his back. But his passion for humanity drove him to continue moving in the way that God was leading. He would be abandoned by those who were closest to him, hurt in ways that we can't even imagine. You see, the enemy will come in and try to steal your passion. And don't you know that there were moments in the life of Christ where the enemy tried to steal his passion? There were. I mean, you think about some of the things he went through, not just the temptation in the wilderness where the devil tried to tempt him to sin, but think about the times that perhaps the devil tried to discourage him in the calling and the anointing upon his life. People were seeking to kill him. People were saying things about him behind his back. People didn't understand the call of God on his life, but that didn't stop him from passionately pursuing it. I want you to know something. Not everybody's going to understand your walk with God. That's okay. It's your walk with God. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, that doesn't mean that gives us a license to live however I want to live because it's my walk. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That means I'm listening to the Holy Spirit. And there's moments that the Holy Spirit will call me to places of passionate pursuit of what he wants to do, and I am to follow. There are, there are times that the Holy Spirit will speak to you. Don't allow what someone else thinks about you, says about you, the way they act towards you. Stop the passion of the calling of God on your life. You see, I believe that God has all of us here for a purpose and a reason. Your calling, your ministry, we need to reignite that flame. Paul told Timothy, fan into flame. Don't let it die out. And I'm calling the church right now, not just the church that's here, but those who are watching on live stream. I'm calling you to a higher place of passion. We don't need a church in this world that is asleep and is allowing the flame to go out. We need a church that is alive with the passion of Jesus Christ. Can anybody hear me? We need a church that understands the purpose for which God has raised us up in this generation. You see, the devil wants to steal your passion. And if he can do it by simply erasing things from your life or, or you have a conflict with somebody or an unforgiven sin in your life, the devil will tell you you're never going to be it, you're never going to do it. But that's a lie. God is calling you to a higher place. God is calling you to a higher anointing. You see, I believe it's time for the church to wake up and, and to reignite her passion, her purpose, and her power. What is our passion? If our passion is to have the best music in town, we're missing the call of God. Now, yes, I want great music. And thank God for our musicians and singers who, who lead us in worship every Sunday. Our passion is this. Jesus Christ was born of the Virgin Mary. He lived a perfect, sinless life. He died on Calvary for the sins of all humanity. 
He became the supreme sacrifice that would break the curse of sin. He was dead. He was buried. And on the third day, he rose again. This is our passion. If anything other than the gospel of Jesus Christ is the driving force behind our passion, then we're our, we, have, we have an illegitimate passion in the church. See, I believe that God is wanting to birth something in crossroads that is far beyond illegitimate. It is conceived of the Holy Spirit. And it brings a passion for what he wants to do in our lives. Listen, when, when I first found out that I was going to be a dad for the first time and that my wife was going to have a baby, I was so ecstatic because there was nothing I wanted more in my life than to be a dad. Now there's nothing I want more in my life to be a granddad <laughs> if my kids are watching. <laughs> But I remember from the moment I found out, I became passionate about that child. I did not meet that child yet. I had no idea who that child was, what they were going to look like, whether they were going to be a boy or a girl. I had no idea. All I knew is that God had created something, and I was passionate about it. This child was going to have everything was going to have the best that I could possibly give them. And they were going to have all of my love and all of my devotion and all of my attention. Think about what God has put in the church through this gospel of Jesus Christ. His only begotten son, born into a world that would hate him. But we as the church, we don't see it as, as something that we are to avoid. This is, this is a treasure that we have in an earthen vessel. And I want to be passionate about it, just like I was passionate about my own children. And when they were born into the world, whoo, there's nothing like holding your child for the very first time. And I looked down at my daughter, and she had this little red curly ringlet hair as, coming out of the womb. And neither me or my wife have red hair. And I looked at my wife, I'm like, is there something you need to tell me? <laughs> she said, no, but there is red hair on her side of the family. But I remember how passionate I became because this was a treasure with which God had entrusted me. And I was going to make sure that it was taken care of, it was nurtured, and that it grew to be exactly what God wanted. Church, I want to tell you something. God has given us Jesus. He has given us the gospel of Jesus Christ. In the church, we, we have it in our hands and in our hearts and in our minds. And this gospel of Jesus Christ has to be the center focal point of everything that we do and that we are. I believe that God has placed within us the potential to be passionate. And if we're not passionate about what God is doing, we need to readjust our priorities. I was talking with someone this morning and they said, you know, over the last year with, with COVID and everything that's happened, it, it's, it's caused us to readjust what's important to us, to reevaluate what's important to us and what's not. Because there's a lot of things that we've had to stop or, or lay down or, or, or do away with because of what we've been through the last year. And it kind of re, refocuses us on what's important. What's important? And so I ask you, what's important in your life? What are you passionate about? What causes your spiritual fervor to rise up? See, I'm reminded of when the disciples after Jesus had gone back to heaven and he left them with a promise and he said, I want you to tarry here in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. 
these scared, frightened, weary disciples that did not know what the future held. And Jesus said, tarry here because there's a promise that's coming. There's something that's going to happen that's going to reaffirm your passion. And I want you to look at this because these 120 went into the upper room and some of them were afraid, some of them were scared, they were following what Jesus told them to do, but they weren't, they were struggling with the passion in their life for it because they were worried about what the future held. The government, the, the spiritual leaders of the day were against them, they were arresting them, they were beating them, they were throwing them in prison, all of these things. And yet they go into this upper room and they begin to pray and they tarry and they're all in one accord and they're, they become passionate about what they're doing. Everything else, they're not letting any other distractions come in. They become passionate about this. And you know how the story goes in Acts chapter 2 that when the day of Pentecost had fully come, when the day was completely there because God will do things in his perfect time. And the scripture says they were gathered together there in the upper room and that the Holy Spirit came into the room as of the sound of a mighty rushing wind. And he came in and he baptized all of them. Flames of fire came down and lit upon their heads and they began to speak with other tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. And I'm asking where is that same passion in the body of Christ today? Where is that same passion in the church today? Where we will say, I don't care what it takes. I don't care what I have to do. This is the promise that God has given me because I know the word of God. And the word of God says, there, there's another promise for this day and age that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Do you believe it? Amen. That I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. And upon my, your servants and my handmaidens, I will pour out my spirit in that day. You see, I believe God is beginning to pour it out. I see it happening in the lives of those here at Crossroads. I see it happening in other places that I've visited throughout the city. I'm watching as God is restoring a passion for the important things in our lives. He's restoring a passion. I want to ask you to stand with me this morning. See, I believe that we need to reignite a passion for God. We need to reignite a passion We need to reignite our purpose. And we need to reignite our power. You see, without passion, there is no purpose. And without passion and purpose, there is no power. And church, I believe with all my heart that God has placed crossroads here in this day and age for more than just coming together and doing church. We are the light of Jesus to the world. But if we're not tending that light, and we're not keeping that lamp filled with the oil of the Holy Spirit and that flame burning bright, our passion for the things of Christ will die. And so I want to invite you this morning to reignite that passion in your life. Reignite that purpose for which God has called you and allow the Holy Spirit to reignite that power in your life. Sometimes the greatest power is encapsulated in the smallest container. And I believe that the power of God 
which is resident in this place, can move us beyond places of complacency and fear and worry into a greater place of passion and purpose and power. You have a calling and a ministry for which God has placed you at crossroads. Let him ignite that passion in you today. I want to ask you if you will, if you say, Pastor, I, I want to reignite that in my life. I want us to come to the table with the Lord as a time of commitment and receive communion in remembrance of our Savior, but as a way of saying, God, I want you to reignite some things in my life. There are some lamps that I have allowed to dwindle. There are some lamps that no longer hold the oil that they used to hold. And this morning, today, God, I want you to change that in my life. If that's you, would you come? And I'm going I'm to give you communion here. Would you come? Take the bread, which represents the body of Christ. His body that he laid down for you and I. The sacrifice that he made was powerful enough to redeem all of humanity. And I'm so thankful for his brokenness. Because in his brokenness, I find wholeness. I find wholeness. And I'm so thankful for that today. And I'm praying, God, as we receive this bread, I pray that you would reignite in us the remembrance and the passion for Christ. Never let it die. But keep us alive. Lord, we receive your body. In Jesus' name, would you partake of the bread? And this cup represents 
precious blood of our Savior. It's a new covenant. It's forging a new relationship of grace with the Most High God. See, there's there's life in the blood. And because of His blood, I live. His blood has broken the curse of sin in my life. His blood has broken the curse of death in my life. Father, I just thank you for this precious blood of Jesus. Lord, during your own passion, your blood was poured out for us. So as we partake of this cup that represents your precious blood, let your passion come alive in us. Remind us. Let us return to our first love in you. Do our first works all over again. Fall passionately in love with you. Lord, we bless you and we thank you for this cup. Would you partake of the cup? so thankful today that you are passionate enough for me to go to the cross. And Lord, I will stir up those embers. I will stir up those ashes in my life. Help me to burn bright for you. Help me to love you. Help me to show forth your grace and your mercy in our world. Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your presence in this place. And I pray that you will go with us as we leave today. Let your blessing be upon each and every one. Shower your Holy Spirit upon us. Lead us, guide us, and direct us. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Now, 
turn to somebody, hug their neck, and tell them, I love Jesus with all my heart, soul, strength, and mind. Team Crossroads.